Coming up, a Russian billionaire is kickstarting interstellar flights. United Launch Alliance and Bigelow team up. And I interview John Banak from VoteForSpace.com. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Welcome to Tomorrow for Saturday, April 16th, 2016. This is Season 9, Episode 13. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. I'll be joined in a moment by Jared Carrion and Space Mike, but before that happens, I'd like to give a huge shout-out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this ap episode happen. These are the people who've contributed $10 or more to this show. We are a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps, and this is the top premium ultra tier of the people who have contributed to the show. To find out how you can become a member of the top ultra super peer premium tier, go over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Easy for me to say. Uh, by the way, if you can't afford to do the top super premium tier, or any tier for that matter, and you just want to help the show, one thing that does help and doesn't cost you anything, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, the more numbers we have there, uh, the more uh, clout it looks like we have online, and that yeah. actually does end up helping us quite a bit. So uh, if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, head on over to uh, youtube.com slash tmr, go boop, and that helps a great boop. deal. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some space news. Space Mike, you're up first. So we have a, a lot of crazy stuff that has happened over this past week. Probably the first one that we wanted to talk about was that a Russian billionaire, Yuri Milner, has announced a project uh, through the Breakthrough Initiatives uh, project called Breakthrough Starshot. And their plan is to send little tiny microchip spacecraft, not just one, but a whole swarm of these things that would have light sails. But the light sails would not be propelled by uh, a solar wind. It would be propelled by lasers. And we actually have a, a video of a, a kind of an animation of their plan. The plan is to build a huge, uh, uh, spend about $100 million over the next few years to begin developing the giant lasers that would be needed to propel these swarms of spacecraft. And you can see that it would it would deploy from some sort of small mothership, uh, which kind of looks like a Cygnus in this video. And then these lasers, boom, would fire and <laughs> try to propel these spacecraft to uh, about a quarter the speed of light to reach Alpha Centauri in 20 years. Alpha Centauri being the closest star system to us. And these tiny one gram uh, uh, nanocraft or starships that they're talking, uh, as they're calling them, uh, would be equipped with uh, some communications equipment that would be able to beam back whatever information they're able to take with lasers. And so that whatever information that they're able to gather, uh, they would be able to send that data back and it would take about four years to, to, to reach us. So this is a really ambitious plan. And if it works, that would be amazing to see or, or, or to get more data to, uh, about Alpha Centauri and to send the first interstellar probe and actually reach its target in a human lifetime. So that sounds really cool, but uh, in my personal opinion, I feel like they're going to have a lot of struggles uh, getting this uh, whole plan working because I think people might object to a Russian billionaire having some super powerful lasers on the ground. But uh, in any case, he's not alone in this. He actually is joined by uh, um, some people on their board of directors are joined by Stephen Hawking and and uh, um, also they're joined by Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, which is kind of strange. And uh, also um, the, the former director of NASA Ames, uh, Pete Warden, is also going to be the head of, or, of, or the program man, or executive, excuse me, the program executive of this whole project. So it's going to be interesting to see if this, uh, this whole plan takes off. Hey, Mike, the chat room uh, is wondering, well, Adrian C. is saying, in order for this to work, those lasers should be in space. And then Green Jim 2 says, well, and how are they going to get those sharks into orbit? Any idea? Just some sharks with freaking lasers on their head. <laughs> exactly. I well, love I the mean, chat room. I mean, it would be better to have lasers in space so that you do not, you know, just all the different issues that you'd have to deal with. I mean, you couldn't let anyone fly over, you know, you'd have to them. make sure... The sharks yeah, exactly. or the lasers? The sh uh, sharks. Yeah. Well, actually, no. I mean, so it, it would be better to have lasers in space because then you're not shooting through atmosphere. I think is the point. But then, right. you know, I assume these la these are not like little laser pointers. I assume they take a great deal of energy to yeah. fire up. 
And, yeah, you know, they're they're talking about phase lasers, which would have a, a large array of small lasers that would be focusing in one point in each one of those uh, uh, like laser dishes that you saw uh, in, in the video there. So each one of those huge dishes that they have represents several hundreds, if not several thousands of much smaller lasers being focused to in increase uh, uh, their power, I guess. Yeah, I just don't see how you could get that much power into space, at least not using today's technology, whereas you could do it from ground. Using today's technology, you could do it from the ground. You're losing a lot through the atmosphere, but that's okay, right? I mean, you're just shooting a lot through the atmosphere. Yeah, and we are talking about something that literally is like the size, like about twice the size of my head, so... You know, it's not even that big, so they might they might be able to get it propelled pretty fast if they were able to do this whole laser thing. But I, I I'm kind of unconvinced that they would get it up to a quarter of the speed of light. Uh, another we'll see. another interesting comment was uh, Torque Madness, M Mattis Torque Mattis hmm. said, "How will such a tiny probe have enough power to communicate with Earth?" Uh, right? Exactly. I mean, you're going. I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. It's it's going to be uh, that signal is going to be weak by the time it makes it back here. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean. Like, to, like, and New Horizon, e just... even in their descriptions, they said that, that uh, these tiny little chip spacecraft would be able to snap pictures, too. So I'm just, you know. And you get it back at one byte per minute. Yeah, unless they're <laughs> thinking about going optical or something. Point zero, 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 one megapixels. Yeah, just to, <laughs> just to give an idea, uh, New Horizons, its communications package, it uses somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 watts, somewhere in there, and it, when, we get the pa when we actually get the signal back, it's about 10 to the negative 21 watts worth of power. So oh. That's from Pluto. So, right. Yeah. yeah huh. this is, that's a little difficult. And we've already got the, the Voyager spacecraft uh, kind of crusting out of our solar system, yeah. and their, their power, I mean, wh what we have to do to listen to them is truly yeah. impressive. Uh, not to say it's impossible. It's certainly possible. It's just you uh, know. Chat room is saying that uh, it was stated it would be optical. Yeah, laser, laser communication. Laser. Yeah. Well, I mean, they lasers. got lasers shooting it up. I mean, as well use a laser going back. All right, yeah. uh, moving on. Uh, as you may have remembered from uh, it's a couple of years ago now when Space Shuttle Endeavor mm -hmm. uh, kind of trolled through the streets of Los Angeles, creating a huge disruption. And everyone was pissed because no one likes Endeavor. Uh, all right, that's not what happened. <laughs> Actually, it was really cool to see everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, right. Check yourself, Ben. <laughs> uh, so, you know, going through the streets, everyone, there's some iconic <laughs> video footage of this, um, but that's not the whole exhibit. Uh, there is also an external tank, external tank 94. There's some video of it rolling out uh, that will be heading from New Orleans to Los Angeles, and it is heading there by a boat. This is the last space shuttle external tank in existence, like actual potentially flight-ready hardware. This particular external tank actually survived Hurricane Katrina, which is pretty impressive. Uh, it's 15 stories tall and weighs 32 and a half tons dry. So th <laughs> that's pretty freaking big. It's actually larger than the entire space shuttle. However, because it doesn't have wings or you know, aero surfaces that they have to like fish around trees and whatnot, it should be easier to move through the streets of Los Angeles. It's going to be it's going to be kind of cool to see that same process yeah. happen one more time. And this is just fantastic footage from the Planetary Society of them rolling it out, putting it on the, on the barge. This is actually going to be going basically around the country. Uh, this la uh, left Sunday, April tw 10th, and it doesn't arrive at uh, Marina del Rey until May 19th. So it's a bit of a journey, but it is going through the Panama Canal. It's, doing, it's, it's a long trip that that has to go on. Yep. And whoosh, there it goes off into the distance. And we'll be getting it here in Los Angeles, and it's going to be part of the exhibit. There you go. That's the, uh, that's the mock-up of what it will all look like. It's kind of hard to tell, but you can kind of see the external tank on the right side with the orbiter attached to it. So the uh, California Science Center is where this is going, and it, the whole exhibit will be placed hopefully like this. It's actually... Uh, it's kind of gone through a few iterations. I believe this is the latest and greatest iteration of what it will look like at the Science Center. Mm -hmm. And the neat thing is, all the different shuttles that we have are in different configurations. So the California Science Center ha will have it vertical, just like as if it were right before a flight. You've got Space Shuttle Atlantis, ev arguably everyone's favorite orbiter, sitting down <laughs> at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, and it is uh, like it's in flight. It, it's truly, have you seen it? No, I haven't been to. Oh, I haven't been there. So. You are a terrible human being. Dot has seen it. Is it's quite <laughs> glorious. <laughs> it it is quite beautiful. It's, it's quite glorious, and it they is. do this fantastic show intro in where this great reveal. I'm not going to ruin it for anyone, but there's this great reveal as if it's in space, and then you've got uh, space shuttle discovery at the Smithsonian as if it, it was just at wheel stop, which um, I mean is neat. 
Uh, but it's like they put the least amount of effort into it. <laughs> so you've got of the three. So you've got the stack at Ascent. Yep. You've got on orbit operations, mm -hmm. and you've payload got, bay is open, and you've got landing, and you got landing. Mm -hmm. cool. Yep. Don't yeah. don't forget the uh, Enterpr uh, Enterprise and Intrepid. Yes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And, uh, the voices. And and in mm -hmm. Houston, they have the uh, shuttle carrier aircraft, the 747 SCA, with a uh, Independence, I think. I think so. Inspiration. Oh, there you go. Uh, yes. Mounted on top of the it. Ska. So lots of cool places you can see stuff. But it, if you remember that LA footage from a while ago with the space shuttle, all gonna happen again. All gonna happen again. Uh, head up to the California Science. If you're interested in helping California Science Center's yeah. museum, I'm sure you can help volunteer to help you know block roadways and yeah, they are looking for volunteers. Yeah, see, so, there you go. Yeah, All right, like, Jared. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of things zipping through an area, uh, there uh, <laughs> there is an interesting discovery that has happened in the past week, yeah. which is that we have found something that kind of defies our predictions and our models in the universe. A very weird kind of thing. So there's these interesting objects called hypervelocity stars. Now, these are stars that are moving at, guess what? Very Hi high velocity. Hypervelocity, I Hyper would say. Hypervelocity. If I were to fathom a guess. So, yes. Uh, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about with hypervelocity, our sun goes around the Milky Way at about 20 kilometers per second, which is just a little bit faster than the average speed that stars go around at about 18 kilometers per second. It's because we have an awesome s solar system and our sun's an overachiever. I agree. That's correct. Um, uh, scientifically proven overachiever. <laughs> and uh, hypervelocity stars, they're going in excess of 1,000 kilometers per second. They See, are. Now they're just showing off. Yes, they are. Yeah. They're, they're like the kids taking six eight. AP courses. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, <laughs> they're hypothesized to form when stars get extremely close to the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. But, like I just sort of previewed at the beginning, scientists have found something that shouldn't exist. And that object is called PB3877. Sounds like a lovely place to visit. Now, this isn't just a hypervelocity star, this is a hypervelocity binary star system. These are two stars that are gravitationally bound with each other, moving at extremely high velocities. It's like they're racing each other. Yeah, potentially they are. Um, they were discovered by a team at Friedrich Alexander University collaborating with Caltech. Very interestingly, the trajectory of this hypervelocity binary shows that it did not originate from the center of our galaxy. So there's another uh, another curveball to throw into this. Now, stellar collisions and supernovae explosions can get uh, other stars potentially up to that hypervelocity speed that you need to exit the galaxy like these are doing, but that would disrupt the binary. The forces of that would move those two stars apart from each other. Um, so uh, there's they really don't understand why we have a hypervelocity binary, and they think that it may have to do with the amount of dark matter that's actually around our galaxy, or they think that it may be the leftover uh, of a galaxy that got eaten by our Milky Way very, very long ago. Um, but they're actually going to use these hypervelocity binaries to look at dark matter uh, distribution. Because when they ran the models, uh, they figured out that with the maximum amount of expected dark matter, a hypervelocity binary could exist. So they're going to use this to sort of look at it to see if they can study certain aspects of dark matter with it. So a very interesting puzzle uh, that may end up solving some other puzzles for us. I think they're just racing. Yeah, they could I be. Think, I think that's all it is, is they're in a race, whoever wins first. The fast and the binary furious. <laughs> so, pretty cool. All right, Space Mike, you talked about laser beams. Now, how about an on-orbit beams? Yeah, let's bring things a little bit closer back to Earth for a little bit. <laughs> so Bigelow Aerospace launched their uh, Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, or BEAM, on SpaceX's CRS-8 mission. And the Dragon capsule, actually we have video of the rendezvous of the, the Dragon capsule where it was grappled by the robotic station arm. And uh, it, the, of course the, the Falcon 9 was launched on April 8th, and uh, this was a couple of days later on April 10th when it was grappled, or rather rendezvoused and grappled by the, the station's robotic arm. And what's interesting is, is uh, ground controllers were the ones who were doing the the first initial uh, um, activities with that and then astronauts on board the station um, uh, f finished the rest rest of it which uh, um, I we actually don't have fo footage of here but of, of the actual birthing of the dragon capsule and uh, it was birthed to uh, node 2 the uh, harmony um, module with the uh, earth facing port and uh, this morning on, on Saturday that today controllers 
at Johnson Space Center removed Beam from the pressurized trunk of the Dragon Capsule and using the cannon to arm two, moved it into position next to Tranquility's aft assembly port. This is a port that's kind of blocked and hasn't really been able to be used since they, they moved it to, to since they, they moved the Tranquility to that position a couple of years ago. And you can see here the the the, the node where, where it's kind of opening up in preparation for the beam module to be birthed. And uh, um, this is kind of a hyper edit here of, uh, uh, this is about 64 times the speed. This whole process took about four hours, but we've condensed it down to just a couple of minutes for you guys. And uh, with this, um, uh, like I said, ground controllers uh, initially um, unpacked the beam module from the Dragon capsule, and then astronauts took over and installed it onto that aft assembly port of the Tranquility module, and it's going to be um, uh, going through a couple of tests before they try to expand the module, which is going to happen near the end of May, and it's going to remain on station for about two years uh, during its test regimen, and uh, this is going to prove out a lot of things for Bigelow Aerospace because with they already they still have the Genesis One and Genesis Two free flying modules in space that are still operating. But with this, they'll be able to have the, the whole human element on board to test out a lot of its systems and also integrated with, you know, a l much larger space station. So this is very cool progress. And uh, I especially like um, in just a second here, we get to see uh, some footage of uh, the, the actual uh, um, birthing nodes being attached. And I just think that that's a, a really cool view of the, the Bigelow module being, being installed here. But uh, there's lots of future plans that uh, uh, Bigelow's Aerospace has, and this could potentially lead to a, a BA-330 module being installed on the space station in the future. But yeah, that's, a, that's the footage I was talking about right there of the uh, beam being birthed in there. So very cool and uh, very excited that this, A, the mission was launched successfully and that it's been uh, successfully birthed and, and that hopefully they'll have all the successful tests they need and get lots of really great data from this. Awesome. All right. Uh, in, <laughs> in addition to the ISS, which is really cool, we've got private space habs. You guys know that we're huge fans of Bigelow Aerospace, and they just recently announced a partnership with the United Launch Alliance to send uh, what I had always referred to as the BA-330, but apparently it's the B-330 mm -hmm. uh, space habs up into space. Now, we can talk about it, but they actually had a press conference, so I'll let them tell you in their own words. We have um, uh, put forth the effort in our company to try to achieve... Uh, uh, two full-scale 330s that will be completed and ready for deployment uh, and, and be able to be shipped out of Las Vegas in the latter part of 2019 and the very early part of 2020 so they could both be deployed in 2020. <clears throat> These new industries will help pay for the future pursuit of eventually lunar enterprises which will characterize <clears throat> phase two and in, in our world of thinking, that's from 21 to 31, 2021 to 2031 <clears throat> of the new space era. Uh, we would love to see uh, Disney have a Disney space station. Now, wouldn't that be cool? You know, we are standing on the very threshold of an expanded and permanent human presence beyond our planet. In the beachhead for that future, the foundation will be the commercialization of LEO. And Bob's innovative technology is really the key that's going to unlock that future. This is so exciting. This is going to greatly expand the opportunities for research, for manufacturing, and yes, for space tourism in LEO. We're really talking about the democratization of space, where it will no longer be the sole domain of highly trained and highly skilled and elite astronauts, but a place where people like you and I, where, where normal, regular men and women go to to live and work. And so this is very, very exciting to me. And I am thrilled to have, be able to announce this partnership and to be able to help Bob by build, you know, helping to create this transportation highway to the destinations that he is creating. This is a very bright future, and you and I right now are standing here looking right into it. 
And uh, yeah, the chat room did absolutely <laughs> notice the reference to Disney that I snuck in there. Made sure that that made it in. <laughs> hey, to <laughs> be fair, Bigelow put that in. Uh, yes, yeah, and he actually was, went on a while longer about Walt Disney and how he would have already been in space if he were alive and how he would love something like this. But I spared oh, you that extra minute worth of... I, it was in my original clip. Yeah. I did pull it out. Um, I, I just thought that would be really cool. I, I, it, will, it won't happen in a modern Disney, but oh my gosh, how cool would that be? Um, it's interesting, though, that he brings up naming because I don't think it really matters, you know, whether it's BA-330 or B-330 because potentially all of those commercial space stations will be named, you know, whatever the anchor tenant wants it to be named. That's correct. That was another thing they brought up that we kind of cut out of that clip, which is that they're planning on doing this, like, general buildings. I mean, Bigelow is a real estate mogul, I guess you would call him. Uh, that's that's how he made his, his money. So he's treating this like real estate, like space real estate. And you can have your anchor tenant like you would have a... A U.S. bank on a or a Wells Fargo, whomever, on a giant stadium. You can do the same thing to one of these big Bigelow modules, a B330. You can be the anchor tenant and have it named after you. How freaking cool would that be? And his point with Disney was, wouldn't it be cool if Disney were an anchor tenant on one of these, and you could use it as a way to send guests up and uh, you know do do that next generation experience. Um, yeah, so it's a really interesting way of looking at it. The, the, it was a short snippet. It, it, you you kind of had to be listening for it a little bit. But he talked about phase one and phase two. Phase one is what they're really working on right now. We've got, we've got the beam module at the International Space Station right now. Uh, Mike was talking about that just a moment ago. That's kind of their test platform. Then they're going to launch their B-330s up on the Atlas V 552. <laughs> that is basically the biggest Atlas V they make. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, 552. It means five-meter fairing. So the, the thing it goes in is the biggest fairing that they have. Huge. The second five means five solid rocket strap-on motors, so five additional boosters on the side of the rocket. Yep. And the two means two Centaur upper stage engines. So it's uh, this thing is oomph. Um, oomph. It's big, but mo more importantly, the fairing is large. And that's why they need this particular... They just need a huge thing, because the B-330 is a large spacecraft, or... Space station, I guess you would call it. Not really a spacecraft, a space station. It's a large space station that expands. Um, so they announced the alliance with, uh, alliance with United Launch Alliance. And uh, you talked about phase one. That's going to happen, you know, sometime around 2020, 2021. And then offhandedly, he talked about phase two, which happens between 2021 and 2031, or 2030 or so. And that's lunar colonization, sending these things to the moon and, and starting a lunar program. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of just a really quick one offset. But I was like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. So they have plans for low Earth orbit, uh, which um, Tori Bruno just always referenced as Leo. That stands for, it's not some dude named Leo that we're trying to... Uh, right. <laughs> you gotta go yeah. save Leo, man. <laughs> <laughs> poor, poor Leo. So low Earth, or low Earth orbit uh, is kind of stage one, but then stage two is the moon. Very, very exciting stuff that was announced. Uh, so there you go. Let's head it on over to Jared. Yep. And talking about stuff that's in orbit right now, we're going to go and talk back about Hitomi, which was the satellite uh, that we spoke about last week that had a failure while it was on orbit. Um, just to get you a little up to speed about it, if you hadn't heard of it, um, it was a X-ray satellite that the Japanese or Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency had launched in February, and then on March 26 during a routine check-in. They found out that it was spinning out of control. They couldn't figure out why. They realized that there was nothing that hit it uh, while it was or in orbit. And, and uh, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency has finally figured out what may be a cause, the, high, the most highly suspected cause as to what happened to Hitomi and why it ended up spinning out of control and having debris around it. So their idea of what happened is that there was a false reading from a sensor. As they were originally doing a calibration of the systems on board. So they were basically making sure that the telescope could actually aim itself as finely as it needed to at objects in order to do very in-depth studies in X-ray wavelengths. Now, when it was done with one of those uh, targets, it was moving to another target, and when it got to that target, it stopped, but the sensors indicated that it was still rolling. And at one point, the main computer overrode a system that would have stopped it from doing what it ended up doing, which is that it overrode the system and said, we need to move the reaction wheels so that way I can stop this roll. So it ended up 
doing that and then it went to check itself again and that sensor was still giving a false positive that it was in a roll. So it basically just started spinning up its reaction wheels as fast as it could <laughs> to the point that it literally spun itself to pieces. So oh. the, the telescope basically spun so fast that the forces on the telescope ripped apart the instruments um, because there are some very long booms on that telescope and that's why it's not working. They admitted finally that they haven't been able to get in contact with it since March 28th. So looks like Hitomi dead on orbit, not going to be able to bring it back. Um, but there is also a telescope that they, we were able to bring back, which was the Kepler Space Telescope. You may have heard that on April 8th during a routine check-in, they found that Kepler was in emergency mode. Um, the folks at NASA immediately went to work to try to resolve the issue. They resolved it on April 11th, and they are now attempting to figure out why Kepler went into emergency mode. All science operations have been suspended until they figured that out. But... Luckily, unlike Hitomi, they were able to recover Kepler, and uh, they say there's no reason why it shouldn't be up and operational very soon, but of course they've just got to make sure that everything's okay with it. I always want, like, when, when it, something goes into emergency mode in space, I want it to, like, the control room monitoring that, I want it to be like the, st the bridge of the Enterprise when it goes red to alert. red alert. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just like, red whoop, alert. Whoop, whoop, but it's not like that at all. Whoop. It's just like a little thing on some one screen that's like, off nominal. Yeah. <laughs> That's all that really happened. But you, you really yeah. want it. In your mind's eye, you imagine like people running around, oh, like, oh gosh. my God. It's like papers trying, flying like everywhere. everyone's doing this in their chairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really feel bad for the Hitomi because we talked about it last week where mm -hmm. there's an instrument on Hitomi, which is this is their third attempt to actually get it in space to work. Yeah, it didn't the last first, week. The first flight, the, the rocket failed. The second flight, it failed during the calibration uh, period where the helium leak or the helium leaked out of it. And now this one, the satellite literally spins itself to pieces. Just <laughs> like, oh, I feel terrible They'll for get that it. team. They'll get it someday. Uh, before we go to break, Space Kyle asks, what funding goal does tomorrow have to get its own uh, Patreon, on its Patreon for uh, Ben to get his own BA-330? Oh my gosh, wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, uh, well, it's a B-330 now, not a BA-330 anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that'd be we, we need to figure out how much uh, that costs and add that as a Patreon goal. I think that would be epic. Right, because we already like 20, we already have a goal of like we'll send we'll send patrons to space, right? Mm -hmm. It's at some obscene level. Yeah, it's like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per per episode. Per episode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, once we get to two hundred fifty thousand per episode, maybe it's like a million per episode. We get funding uh, like uh, I think more like twenty million per episode. Per, you think it'd be that more would like be that? a little bit yeah, because we have to factor in at least like what two hundred and fifty million just for the Atlas Five launch. So yeah, and yeah, you're probably whatever right. Whatever the price of the B three maybe is. maybe it's a hundred million per episode. We'll just say well we'll say a hundred million per sure. episode when we reach that level we'll actually get our own tomorrow ba330 space hotel and then what we need to do is like at 100 no at 100 million we we get the the naming rights to it and we should have enough money to fly people up to it once in a while too. yeah and if we hit 250 million we'll do episodes from the b330 yes so. there you go there Perfect. you go how awesome is that all right we're going to take a quick break break and when we come back we're going to talk about voteforspace.com stay tuned we'll be right back And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get into our main topic this week, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the Patreon premiere members. They've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. But wait, there's more. We've also got our Patreon producers. These are people who've contributed $5 or more. Each different level gives you different rewards. If you'd like to find out how you can crowdfund the crowd shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tm. R -O. All right, we're going to hand it over to Jared and John Thank for the you. next segment. Thank you so much. All right, and let's just go ahead and get started with this segment because we have got a guest finally, which of course <laughs> makes everybody very, very happy that we have a guest uh, going on with us here. But we have John Benak from Vote for Space. So, John, Back welcome. Up. Welcome. How's it going? Pretty Great good. To be here. We're glad to have you on here today, and you're going to be telling us 
about a very interesting thing that you are doing called VoteForSpace.com. So why don't you just go ahead and tell us, what is VoteForSpace.com? VoteForSpace.com is a political action committee with the agenda of promoting legislation that benefits space exploration. So can you tell us a little bit about what exactly a political action committee is? Because we do, we do have some sure. international viewers, so they may not yes. be familiar with, with how that works in U.S. politics. Yeah. So um, the government has laws that basically control how organizations and companies and individuals can act in an election. Like, you know, we can't just go buy votes. We can't pay money to have a politician be the president. And so a political action committee is a tax-free organization that the government has created so that people can spend money legally to influence elections and uh, support political candidates. Very cool. So uh, what are some things that you guys have actually done so far? Because I know you guys have actually visited yeah. with a couple, uh, a couple right. people in the government. Yeah. So uh, yesterday I visited at the office of Pete Sessions, who is a pretty important Republican legislator. He's been in the House for decades. And what's important about this is that I live in Pete Sessions' district. And so that means that he listens to me where he wouldn't necessarily listen to you all because he represents me. Uh, so I went in, I visited with the Staffords, I gave him Dana Rohrabacher's SEDS Act, which is the Space Exploration Development and Settlement Act that mandates that NASA has in their constitution the settlement of space, which I think is terrific and I think most of you all will agree. So I went in, I sat down, I said, look, here's a bill. I want you to vote yes on this bill. I want you to co-sponsor the bill. Um, you know, I've donated to your campaign. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to encourage my friends to vote for you in as much as you are supporting this bill. So, so that's the type, yeah, that's the type of activity that needs to be done everywhere. Everyone watching this show should be doing that. Yeah, and just to sort of... Uh follow up with that, how can people get involved with VoteForSpace.com? Sure. Well, you can email volunteer at VoteForSpace.com to get information about, for example, the bill that you can print out, uh, information about your representative. Uh, this is the coolest thing about Vote for Space. It's a button that you can wear on your shirt awesome. and show everybody that Very you nice. vote for space. Uh, you know, I was wearing this when I went in yesterday. So yeah, email volunteer at VoteForSpace.com. So are there any other groups that VoteForSpace.com is working with besides the, the expected uh, members of the U.S. government? Are there like any groups like the Planetary Society that you guys may be working with sometime in the future? Yeah. Well, so I'm a member of the Planetary Society. I'm a member of the National Space Society. And, uh, you know, because it's, it's in its early stages, we haven't yet gelled with, you know, all of the leadership of all these organizations. Um, but uh, one person who's had a pretty big impact is uh, Rick Tumlinson, who is the founder of the Space Frontier Foundation. And what he's done is uh, he's given me some pointers about the decades of experience that he has had in advocating for space policy and the ways that he's done it. And he's given me some good ideas about ways that, um, for example, I can uh, really be appealing to some of these candidates that I'm trying to engage with. So ultimately, what I'd like to do is take the Planetary Society and the National Space Society, which are 501c3 organizations, and basically carry the ball in a, a direction that they cannot take it because of the legal limitations on a 501c3 organization. For example, a 501c3 organization cannot endorse a candidate, right? They can't give money to a candidate, yep. and that's fine. Uh, so, you know, Vote for Space is not trying to replicate anything that they're doing, but to do what they cannot do. So. Yeah, the punchline is I want to tap into these wonderful networks of engaged, intelligent people that are already organized and connected and basically just foster that, that step right now in this campaign season. Yeah, one of our viewers in the chat room, Space Kyle, is saying that if you care about space, you need to care about politics. And that's a, that's a pretty big theme, especially here in the United States with, with all the stuff that our uh, space program, NASA, has to go through. Um, so what's, um, what's a good way for people to maybe spread the need to care about the politics? You guys yeah. have any good strategies to get people interested in space? Sure. Specifically from a political standpoint? Yeah. Well, um, you know, so Pete Sessions, he may not care at all about space. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> 
he doesn't need to care about space because the only thing that I care about is that he votes yes on the SEDS Act, mm -hmm. right? Yes. He doesn't, yeah. And so, and so uh, you know, it's one thing to get our friends and neighbors to care about space. And organizations like the Planetary Society and Space Frontiers and, are, are doing tremendous work in that. And I want to maintain laser focus on having that discrete effect on policy. And so, you know, honestly, the Vote for Space organization is not right now trying to advocate, you know, this love of space because the fact is that tens of millions of Americans already care about space. And I'm trying to tap into those people to make people like Pete Sessions, uh, you know, support the policy. And, and the way that, and, and the reason that Pete Sessions is going to care is because money and votes, you know, if we can get the campaign contributions from people who care about space and the votes from people who care about space, then Pete Sessions is going to say, I want to represent these people that are supporting me. You know, I want their support. And so with voter turnout at 40 percent or, you know, I mean, who knows where it's at, depending on where you're at. If we got 100 percent voter turnout for people that are passionate about space, then these legislators who maybe don't care about space and never will are going to represent us. It sounds like you're trying to hit this voting cycle. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of a presidential race here in the U.S. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems like the current president candidates don't really have a strong platform for space at all. Are you yeah, combating right. that at all? Or is there anything you can do there? Sure. Well, um, best case scenario, we'll have uh, millions of people involved in this organization, and they will be asking candidates about how they feel about space. You know, there was a, a town hall meeting and uh, a young woman asked Donald Trump some specifics about his abortion policies. And Donald Trump in this town hall had to answer her and maybe clarify something that he hadn't been as forthcoming about previously. And so, you know, imagine if we have a, an act, a politically engaged base of people who care about space who are asking Ted Cruz or asking Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, hey, how do you feel about Mars colonization? Uh, we can't wait around for these candidates to step forward and say how they feel about it. We can't expect the news media to drill them on it. Um, so, you know, that's with regard to the presidential race. Right now, um, I'm more interested in, for example, the House of Representatives. We've got 500 different, you know, close to 500 different seats being competed. And it's that smaller level thing where you have these people that are shaking hands in their small districts and, you know, their local regions where I think that we can have a, a tremendous impact, for example, on the Space Exploration and Development uh, Settlement Act. So do these smaller things add up to the bigger stuff? Because you, you look at, again, the presidential race or even the, the House, uh, the Science Committee. Um, sure. You know, they're the ones who are essentially setting policy for these big programs, for big mm -hmm. programs like NASA. You talk about going right. to Mars. That's not going to be done at the smaller level. That's going right. to be done with huge globs of money and huge programs. Sure. Uh, sure. So do you start small and kind of work your way forward, and, and you don't really, we can't target this presidential race because there's just not enough uh, yeah. momentum? So Vote for Space is an organization that is going to be around for decades, okay? And there's, you know, there, there's many things that we can do and should do in time. Uh, this election cycle will get members, will get people engaged, and in the future, you know, we'll advance a candidate for president, maybe. <laughs> uh, probably not. But, um, you know, this bill, for example, H.R. 4752, Dana Rohrabacher has advanced this bill. He has someone named Tony DeTora on his staff already. And these people are already hooked into some of these space advocacy organizations who are doing this work of getting the bill to the floor, hopefully, eventually. Uh, at the Space Symposium recently, this representative from Oklahoma has this Space Renaissance Act, right? So we don't have to, you know, today get these bills forward. We just need to get them passed. And the way that they get passed is by votes. I can vote for Pete Sessions. Pete Sessions can vote for this bill. I can give money to Pete Sessions. The Vote for Space organization can give money to Pete Sessions' candidacy. And so, you know, it's not real. I don't think it's a small thing. I mean, the passage of this bill will change NASA's constitution to say that they will settle space. Uh, that's a pretty big thing. And this bill, uh, it's happening. It's, it's going to be voted on. Very cool. So, I was just yeah. wondering about Vote for Space as a PAC. Sure. Is there a specific preference that you guys have? Like, do you guys specifically 
want to see the advancement of NASA? Do you want to specifically see the advancement, that is a great the advancement of private industry? Do you want both right. to work together? What's, yeah. what's the overall uh, policy, I guess, that you guys like to pursue? Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes with everything. And, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, personally, I, you know, there's all these schisms. There's moon versus Mars. There's robots versus uh, humans. There's planetary science versus space science. Uh, private versus commercial. Uh, you know, American cooperation with other nations versus, you know, nations kind of forging ahead and, and doing their own thing. And um, in order to have as broad a group of people as possible, and still have a cohesive policy, we can't pick sides in that. We don't want to pick sides in that. And the idea that space is a zero-sum game and you're going to have to choose one or the other is really counterproductive thinking. So, you know, uh, I would love to personally go to Mars someday, but I'm certainly not going to do it on the back of climate science or, you know, uh, or, or somehow limit you know, the Sirius XM satellite radio role in space because all I care about is Mars, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really important that the organization and the members of the organization are inclusive and welcoming of people who maybe don't have their same priorities. So what can people do if they're interested in this? Like, hey, this is something, yeah. I, I'm interested in space. I right. want to become a part of this political act. Or at activity. least just want a button. Or I, or I want a button. Show the button again. So you sent us yeah. buttons, and unfortunately, we don't have. They're, they're really cool looking buttons. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So you want a button. You want to be a part of this. What can you do? Yeah, so, so uh, I will mail you buttons. <laughs> I will mail you this bill right here. Uh, this is a cover letter that I wrote and delivered electronically and in person. It's a petition. Right now, uh, you know, it doesn't have a lot of names on it, right? But, but the, if you're watching this show, this is what you need to do. You need to know who your representative is, and you need to go visit them with all your buddies, and you need to say, hey, these are the reasons that I care about this, and I want to support you in, the, in as much as you are supporting what I care about, right? That's what democracy is supposed to be. So uh, to be specific, Ben, if you're listening and you want to be involved, then you need to do as I have done and do as so many other people have done in a coordinated way. Right now, the marching uh, order and the rallying cry is the SEDS Act. And it's not guaranteed that it's going to get passed. In the future, we have other acts, we have other bills, uh, other candidates. But this is the seed to kind of show us so we can flex our muscle and have this, um, you know, this rallying, organizing call to, to have an impact in a political way that the advocacy organizations are legally prohibited from doing. I think a lot of people just kind of assume that their time isn't worth it because nothing's ever going to change. And so they don't even make the effort to go out to, to, sure. write, to sign petitions, to go yeah. visit their elected officials, to do right. any of that legwork. But I think that happens across all industry. And if right. you actually take just a few moments, just to, I mean, really in person is the best way, but even totally. a phone call or just a letter, anything, well, great. any yeah. little bit helps build on top of the foundation that you're trying to, to yeah. set here. Yeah, and, and you know what, Ben, things change every day. Every time a law is passed, something changes, okay? When Nixon canceled the Apollo program, something changed. Didn't, uh, didn't they stick a balloon on the space station today? <laughs> yeah. Not really a balloon, no, but yeah, an, exp an expandable <laughs> module. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. sorry, like, no disrespect. I think it's tremendous. It's all good. <laughs> so, so the point is, it, th change is inevitable. We can't help but have things change. And the question is, are we going to be a part of it? Are we going to be driving it? And, you know, the reason that I created this political organization is because, oh, people say, oh, you know, these legislators, all they care about is money, you know, campaign, it's, it's all terrible. Well, fine, let's take the money, let's, let's play ball, let's fight fire with fire, let's donate to these candidates, tell them why we're donating, and get out and vote on the 8th. Uh, you know, there, you, maybe there's a candidate that you're not as excited about, but as you engage with them, you will become a bigger part of this political process. Uh, John, do you have time to come back for After Dark by chance? Because we have more questions from the chat room. Great. So okay. uh, just to give you a quick rundown for those of you watching live as to what's going to happen in After Dark, we've got a question from Dan TC 24 talking about incumbents and how they're easy to sway. And so uh, what are you going to do about uh, the people uh, who, who aren't easy to sway and, and how do you... 
to get people sure. to vote for you. Yeah, we should um, talk about that. Get a rundown of what the SEDS uh, Act or the SEDS bill okay. key points are. Check it out at voteforspace.com right now if you want. Yep. Yeah, uh, and then uh, talking about who, and Tawicket has a question about who you pick to choose to support, uh, um, stuff like that. So that's what sure. we're going to be talking about in After Dark, okay. continuing this conversation. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking about comments from last week's show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed $10 or more. Thank you to every one of the premier members of tomorrow. We've also got our producers of tomorrow. They're the people who have contributed $5 or more. Then we've also got our Patreon Plus subscribers. These people have contributed $2.50 or more. We were just talking about After Dark and how we're going to be bringing John back for that. Well, those people in Patreon Plus, they're going to have instant access to After Dark as soon as we post it on demand, which is about one day. We try to post it at the same time as the live show. Show, but up to 24 hours past the live show. For everyone else, you're going to have to wait about four weeks to get access to that After Dark episode. And there's more. If you just want your name in the show and you want access to some of our Hangouts and other cool things, you can be a patron subscriber. These are people who have contributed anywhere between one penny, that's right, one U.S. penny to $2.49. Get your name in the show and a few other rewards. As I've been saying, we're crowdfunded. Every single penny helps. Head on over to patreon.com slash tmro for the reward levels and all the different things uh, that we're trying to get and do. All right, let's go ahead and get started with uh, comments from our last show. Uh, I believe it was called uh, Hashtag Relaunch. Relaunch. It was the Rapid Reusability Renaissance, or Rrrr. Uh, <laughs> no <Yeah>. acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Rrrr is <laughs> fun. There you go. Cat Chom, take us away. Oh, goodness. So this first comment, comment comes from YouTube from David Cowdery. This was a much longer comment, but the gist of it is... That is an understatement. Yes, it, this was a very long comment, but it, it was good. It was a lot of a lot of good points. But the very end, he says, to me, it's about mitigating risk, reducing the required checks between flights, and finding ways to safely increasing maintenance schedules. The idea, you know, we like you said, we were talking about rapid reusability, Renaissance, uh, Blue Origin, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, even ULA is talking about it, uh, you know, trying to make rocket flight a little bit more like airplane flight. I think is, is kind of where that uh, that particular comment was coming from. I'm not sure ULA is more like airline flight. <laughs> That's more like you'd be, you'd, right, you'd be landing are... and then you jettison your engines and crash land the plane into the ocean. They are talking about... <laughs> it's not quite the same. <laughs> they have begun the conversation about some reusability on some of their right. parts and in a rapid yes. fashion. So yeah. And their upper stages as well. Too. Yeah. Right. Actually, they have a so, really cool plan for their upper stages. They we do. Should, I we saw haven't that, talked so. about that on the show. We need to talk about their plan. I think they're, we do. Because you, you take the stage one plans from SpaceX and the stage two plans from United Launch Alliance and Mary them together and you've got a really cool thing going on yeah yeah now, maybe they'll collaborate <laughs> <laughs> next up capcom oh wait 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 wait. Uh, um what's your name space mike did you have a comment there actually um uh the notes that i've been preparing for my space pod that's going to be coming out uh this wednesday um for patrons uh it'll be coming down on tuesday is about the whole ula cis lunar 1000 and uh, some of the other advanced uh, next steps concepts that other companies are looking at kind of related in the same vein so nice. hopefully i'll be able to put ASUS. a good review together of all of these uh, ambitious plans that they have for uh, the reusable upper stages w will you have aces in there are you gonna be talking about that yeah that's what i'm talking about I'm talking about the aces and all of the fuel depots that they'll have to be able to refuel 
dual aces and uh, um, uh, 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 of course uh, how Zeus fits into all of those plans, the mast and aerospace uh, 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 centaur lander that, that could be used for uh, um, uh, multiple trips going to the moon and um, uh, just the whole Cis Lunar 1000 plan that ULA has. And there's other, there is other partnerships and collaborations that are part of that. And that all is under a, a whole NASA study called Next Step. And ULA is just one of the contractors that are uh, studying plans like this. Bigelow Aerospace is part of that as well, Orbital ATK, and a couple others that you guys might be surprised to hear about. So that's, and I, and I did kind of talk about this uh, in a space pod last year when uh, this whole thing was first uh, announced, but there's been a lot of progress since then. So um, hopefully I'll be able to put a good view of all that stuff for you guys. It's easy to pick on the incumbents and be like, blah, 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 incumbents are not do, doing neat and cool things. Uh, but you, they, they actually, they are talking about some really cool, awesome things. Yeah. Uh, now, the trick is changing that from just talk into, you know, bending Action. metal and actually making things, right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but if anyone can do it, uh, ULA, yeah. I, I bet they've got they've I, got the mind, the brain power, and the, cap the capabilities. Yeah, they just had the 30-second space symposium this week, and ULA was very adamant that they are, that they are working towards it. So, but we'll we will need to wait for the future to see. I, that, I just so. realized the 30-second space symposium sounds like a 30-second, like one half minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> talk about space symposium. Space you have one half minute go. T minus 30 talk. <laughs> Brought to you by cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Capcom. We're not after dark yet, Mike. Wow. Capcom. Capcom. All, All right. right. Uh, also <laughs> abort. Of, abort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also off of YouTube, this one comes from Raymond Earl. Uh, reusability. Can't we say? Can't we have say seven rockets built? Maybe SpaceX ready to launch. That would give time to thoroughly check each rocket after it came back, then put it back in the row ready for launch. I know the cost would be insane, but all production lines are designed to drive the cost down by producing more cheaply. Could be a start of a space fleet. Yeah, we had that before. It's called the space shuttle. It wasn't seven, but it was five, and it didn't work. So I mean, I, I hate to be harsh, but yeah, no, you that's have true. you have to have rapid, low cost. It's not just rapid reusability because if you have, if you can rapidly reuse it at twice the price of building a new one, what's the point? It has to be a rapid, low-cost reusability like an airplane or some similar, like that general concept yeah. of you drop it on the ground, you do a 10-point inspection, whatever it really is, fuel it back up and send it back into space. That will drive down the cost of space. If you have to do a bunch of work to it and you have to sit there and put humans on it and put machines on it and figure it out and take it apart every time, you know that all costs time and money. And even if you have a fleet of 100 of these things, you know, and so you can fly them every day. It still takes a lot of time and money then to refurbish them as opposed to refly them yeah. uh, and reuse them. And that's it's not the ultimate point. Yeah, it's, even sitting on the ground is costing you money. Exactly. As well, yeah, so. you're taking up yeah. space. You have to put yep. them in storage. Yeah, absolutely. So, yep. in, interesting idea. We did it with the space shuttle. Uh, it's kind of a bad example of the space shuttle, but it's also a kind of a very relevant example of how mm -hmm. flipping expensive the space shuttle was. We don't want a repeat of that. All right, yeah. next up, Capcom. Uh, also off of YouTube. Uh, this Actually, all of these comments came off of YouTube <laughs> yeah. this particular time. Our YouTube comments were crazy pants, and like nobody said anything just about anywhere else. It was really sort well, of impressive. Although I always find it humorous that within 24 hours, we always have, always have at least one person who thumbs downs our YouTube videos. Yeah, I don't think they even watch them. I, you know, they may not, or, or they go, I hate Ben. Wait, isn't that Jared? I thought that was you. <laughs> no, just kidding. Yeah, well, you know, once Ben realizes <laughs> that Pluto isn't a planet, I'll start thumbsing up it. So. <laughs> oh, that's where we're getting that thumbs yeah. down from. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, this one comes Let's from make Pluto great again. <sighs> Astro, Astro Nahel, I can say it. Uh, I feel like there are a lot of lots of unfair basis in favor of Mastin on the show. Yes, they have rapid reusability, but they haven't really delivered any useful payloads or the like. Uh, bias is the word you were looking for. What did I say? They basis? Unfair, yeah, oh, bias. Unfair, unfair bias in favor of Mastin. Uh, yeah, you know, I, you know, I openly admit I have a man crush on Mastin. I do too. Yeah, so we no. we do have man crushes, man crush I. My crushes? I, I don't. On um, you don't? You have a woman crush? I just have a regular crush. I just want to be really clear about that. Wait, wait, that. Mike, do you have a man crush on Mastin? Do we oh. all man do we all crush on Mastin? A little bit, yeah. Alright. <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, um I I so that's not an unfair point. You you do want like you do want to fly stuff and you do want to do cool things, but he is flying things, right? It's not like he's not bending metal and making things, making fire, learning stuff and doing cool things. It's just all here on Earth. I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. 
that their ro one of their rockets has flown over 200 times successfully. So just wondering if there's another rocket out there that's done that. I think the so. point, though, so yes, but yeah. I think the point is that <laughs> it hasn't done anything other than fly over 200 times, right? It's an I experimental vehicle. That's so still important. It, it is. That's very important. I'm not saying, obviously yeah. I man crush on I Mastin, know. and I think that what they're doing is awesome. But I think the point is, yeah, you can learn all of this stuff, but if you don't apply it to anything, what's the point? Mm -hmm. Right? Is, is that a better way of phrasing that question? Yeah. I think, so, yeah. Uh, Good and I, I think right now, yeah, you could you could think that, but there's going to be a time where it will be applied, and then you're going to take all of these things that he's learned and apply them all at once, and it's going to blow your freaking mind. Yeah. Uh, so He's the dark horse. He is. <laughs> and and I think he, he does this on purpose. He purpose, I'm near positive, he hasn't said anything, but I'm near positive he does this on purpose. He doesn't try to bring a lot of attention to what he's doing, but what he, when you start piecing together all these little things, he's the autonomous landing component, the reusability, re being able to refly, the same V, Vehicle, you know, being able to hover and float and like re all of this stuff together. Oh, he's got that DARPA contract thing going on. He's got a lunar lander going. And then you go and slam them all together and you go, oh my God, he's got the pieces for something incredible. He's yeah. building this incredible puzzle piece, but just like a regular, you know, actual like puzzle, until you put that last piece in place, it doesn't make a cohesive picture. Yeah. Was that a good example? That is a good example. I feel like that's a good example. Okay. Good so I think, yeah. I think that's why we man crush on uh, Mastin because we actually, we can see the box that the puzzle came in and we know what yeah. it kind of generally looks like and we're just waiting for him to finish up all those pieces and we're like, yeah. yay, it's going to be awesome. Go Dave, go, go Dave. Dave. We're not going to help you, but go. <laughs> <laughs> you can build the puzzle yourself, but it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Next up. Actually, <laughs> I, if, if I had any talent that Dave could use, yeah, I would if we, love if to we, work. If we actually could help him in any way, I'm useless would. to Dave. That's why it's more like Dave's like, go away. You're getting in the way of me building this puzzle. I would love to work <laughs> for Dave Nastin. That would be awesome. All right, so let's stop man crushing on Dave and let's just move on. Okay. I hope he watches this episode. And actually, part of me hopes he doesn't watch this episode. Hi, Tiff. Capcom. <laughs> This one comes from Keith Deal. Get us out. Dive, dive, I alert. Comment. I love this comment. I'm with the guy on the left. Bigelow all the way. Wait, am I the guy on the left? P.S. I'm sorry. I don't know your name. <laughs> I'm the guy on the left, right? <laughs> you, yeah. I would, I would so the, the internet's agreeing with me. Oh, that's a mistake. Left. You're on oh, stage Keith. left. Keith, don't, don't agree with me. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the losing bet here. <laughs> you always want to agree with Jared or Space Mike or Carrie Ann. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, Bigelow all the way. I mean, the International Space Station is not bad, but I think what Bigelow is doing is more important and more awesome. Yeah. In my humble opinion. Especially now this because the, after that announcement this week. Yeah, I'm they're super talking about moving about on to the. Yeah. yeah, they're talking about doing stuff yeah. on the moon. They're talking about building colonies in low Earth orbit that other mere mortals can use. They're talking about um, opening up the space frontier. Yep. International Space Station to. It has done some really cool experiments, but the really great experiments that they could have done, they've done some neat experiments, but the great experiments they could have done, they've never flown. Yeah. The, and so... The ISS is really a great example of what could have been as opposed to what it has done. That's so. why I'm, I, you know, I... I, I get, I get it, it now. Yeah, okay, I get cool. It. I yeah, get yeah. it. Yeah, that's a good so. way of putting it. Next yeah. up, Capcom. This one comes from Thomas Cassidy. <laughs> <laughs> that, hang on, that is his username on YouTube. So that we just copy and paste. Yeah, Thomas Cassidy, <laughs> who who then proceeded to pretty much not capitalize anything in his grammars. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to whisper everything yes. else. Everything that goes up in a plane is not considered to be a pilot. What? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone that goes up in the plane is not considered a pilot. So I think space tourists is the right way to look at it. Yeah, we're talking about how we name, like, if you go into yeah, space, are you, you, are an, you astronaut? an astronaut? Yeah, you're, yeah. I, you know, as I think about it, we're so early in, we're so early in the industry, it's neat. I go back and forth, I'm like, I would love to know what this is and kind of figure it out so that we have something, so it's all kind of set. At the same time, who cares? We're not there yet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, space flight participant. Space That's flight the one I've always heard. You know, and if you around, ask me again so. tomorrow, I'll be like, this matters. And you ask me the next day, I'll be like, this doesn't matter. And then ask me the day after that, I'm like, this matters. So <laughs> you know, like, I, today, I happen to be on one of the days of like, eh. Yeah. Even in the NASA astronaut office, isn't there a difference between getting your space wings and getting your pilot space wings? So. I think so, you know. yeah. I know there's certain they're, patches. They're known as astronauts. Wow. I, I know there's certain patches that you can get, like the Mach 25 patch. You have to have done something very specific to get that one. Interesting. So, right. Yeah. That's why it's such That's a highly cool. coveted patch. 
So. Nice. Yeah. All right, so last comment, again off of YouTube, comes from Rune12358. Again, a much longer one, but we uh, narrowed it down to this. Barely. None of the International oh, Space... Wall of text. Uh, sorry, none of the International Space Station modules exceeded the maximum payload of the EELVs or... or That's the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle. Thank you. Or Proton, neither in mass or volume. In fact, the heaviest modules at launch were the Russian ones, the Zvezda and the Zara, at something like... Zarya. Tw what did I say? Zarya. Zarya. Doesn't matter, keep going. Okay. Zvezda. Uh, the U.S. modules just lacked the autonomous docking capability that the Russian modules had and relied on the space shuttle to do the rendezvous and docking. I don't know if you mentioned that slide. 20 metric tons is oh, the... Oh, 20 uh, metric tons. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the size of that. Yeah, but it's size, too, right? I, I don't think that any of those vehicles can lift the modules of yeah, that size. Heavy, they don't have a fairing large enough. Yeah. So I guess you could build a custom fairing... Maybe. Yeah. But there were a number are, of are comments you, that were like this in YouTube. This is why I, I chose this one, or I just happened to chose this one. Uh, a lot of people were saying, like, you could have used Proton for a lot of these modules, that it wasn't just uh, a lifting capability, but because of size. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm just saying, that's what YouTube if, was saying. If you look at the rockets that the United States had at the time when we started construction of the International Space Station, mm -hmm. it would have been very difficult to fit those into the fairings of that. Because you, did, you didn't have Delta IV, you didn't have Atlas V, you had Atlas II or Atlas III, um, you had the last of the Titan IIs. You did have Titan IVs, but those tended to go uh, quite often. Um, and I think Delta II was your other option because Boeing, or uh, yeah, the, the work was being you done. You say Delta II, and I always think of the video where we're like, we've had an anomaly. <laughs> just so, raining fire yeah, on so the launch pad. Just, uh, you know, there weren't the actual rockets besides the space shuttle from the United States side as to as to... Allowing but you their to point add is that it's an access. international space station. It doesn't have to be from the United States side. That's it could, true. It could be a Soyuz Absolutely. rocket. It could be. Yeah. It could be anything else. But again, uh, you, some of the payloads certainly you could have brought up. But I don't think you could have built it as it is today because they they would have had to change something. How's that? So, yes. uh, if we go back in time, we get rid of the space shuttle, something would have had to change. Would have had to have a bigger fairing or some other method to get some of these payloads up yeah. there. The American modules would have had to have been way heavier so that they all would have been able to control themselves, just like mentioned in the comment. Exactly. Um, you know, the, the space shuttle was, you know, did all of that for them with the, with the space shuttle robotic arm. But if they need to have thrusters and sensors and, and a, a LIDAR or ha however they would be able to do the docking back then, you know, that would just make it heavier and more complex and bigger. All right. We're going to, uh, we're going to call this an end to this particular show. Thank you everyone so yep. much for watching. We're going to bring John back. For After Dark, uh, talk to him. We have more questions we want to ask him. I think oh, yes. it's a fascinating conversation. So uh, we'll talk to him after dark. For all of you who are Patreon Plus subscribers, that will be available in your Patreon feed as soon as it is posted on demand. For everyone else, it will be available in approximately four weeks. I will not be here next week. Uh, it will be Jared hosting the main show next week. And then the following week, boom, Carrie Ann will not be here. It will be... Jared hosting. Oh, wait, no, I don't know how that works. Yeah, I don't know how wait, that works. Wait, wait, can I become either. Capcom? You can, or I could become Capcom if you want that to. That would not. I don't know. You'd be like, hey. Uh, let me be Capcom. Let me be Capcom. No, I'm no, we'll use Kylo. So uh, you can't tell before we're going to break or before we close Husband. the show. You can't tell uh, right over. As I look over here and I'm looking right at Jared, directly behind him in my line of sight is, is Kylo, a little Kylo Ren figurine. Kylo Ren. And so he's doing like this motion. So I'm looking at Jared. I have Jared like right here and right behind him. I got Kylo Ren being like, oh, I control Jared. It's pretty awesome. So I don't really have a problem with that. So. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. I won't.